Welcome to TPGI's Real People, Real Stories podcast, where you'll find interesting and diverse stories from folks working to make the world a more inclusive place. Hey, welcome to Real People, Real Stories podcast brought to you by TPGI. I am your host, Mark Miller, thanking you for helping us keep it accessible. Do us a favor. If you're enjoying the Real People, Real Stories podcast, share it. Tell someone about it. Even link to it from your accessible website. Well, listen, thank you, everybody, for joining us again. Um, we love you. We love our audience. And I'm really excited to bring you our guest today, um, Welby Broadus, who we've spoken to before. He came in and spoke to our um, our team here at uh, TPGI. Um, and uh, w- once he did that, his stories were so much fun and so dynamic. And um, he's got just a... a is that a great life and some great messages that go along with it? Um, I knew we had to come in and chat with him and share him with all of you. So, Welby, welcome, welcome, welcome to the podcast. It's great to have you here. Um, and I also want to welcome Dara, our my my co-host, um, who you guys have seen uh, 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 here and there. So, welcome, Dara. Um, Welby. Can you just start off by giving us a little bit of background about who you are? And um, particularly the thing I'm most excited about is that while everybody else was watching Netflix during the pandemic, you were writing a book. (laughs) So I definitely want to hear about your book too. So tell us a little bit about who you are and and about how this notion of uh, writing a book came about. Okay. Well, thanks for having me, Mark. I appreciate you and Dora having me on your show today. Uh, yeah, I'm sure. well with this. Um, so I, I was, I was, well, I was, I don't know for sure. I, either I was born busy in pair or I ended up getting busy in pair while, while I was at the hospital. I know that when I left the hospital, I was busy in pair. I didn't say that much. And what happened was I was born premature. I had to stay. My mom left, came home after maternity stay. I had to stay in the hospital 10 extra days in an incubator. And what my research showed me what I found out. Actually, my research from my book and found out that um, I think what happened is I was exposed to too much oxygen while I was in the incubator, hmm. and it caused me to be visually impaired. And my diagnosis is optic atrophy and um, nystagmus. And optic atrophy, atrophy is I, I'm severely nearsighted that I'm considered to be legally blind, both my eyes. And then nystagmus is I can't I can't control the muscle in my left eye, so my eye it tends to move on its own left and right. So it's hard for me to use my left eye. So I may not use my right eye every time when I'm talking, when I'm seeing and talking to people. So, and then, so when I got home from the hospital, you know, I I didn't know this as a kid, but I always see an eye specialist even today. If I go to a regular eye doctor, it's just like, they, they can't do nothing for me, but it'd be good for them to be able to look at my eyes, but I won't get nothing out of it. So I always seen a specialist. But I didn't realize that as a kid. And I had glasses and everything even before I was five years old. And I just thought I wore glasses just like everybody else. It's just normal. Some people wore glasses because the eyes weren't that good and some people didn't. I didn't I didn't think my I can just be that, that severe and that's how I actually got into school. So so when you're growing up that young and you're starting to go to school and, and all that, you don't realize that you're different in any way. Is that that's what you're saying? Right. Yeah. So Especially elementary school, you know, elementary school is, and it, let me go back. So my, I, w- I went to the Cleveland Clinic in Cleveland, Ohio, the eye specialist. I, just, I always saw an eye specialist, and they suggested to my parents that I end up going to a specialized school mm-hmm. for the blind and vision impaired. And at that time, my brother, who's three years younger than me, he was he was just born, and my my parents had just moved into this house, and so they really couldn't afford for me to go to the school. So I ended up going to regular traditional school, and Elementary school was fine because it's more hands-on. You know, you sit in the groove, you basically plan to learn how you learn, things like that. Right. I didn't realize I was different until I actually got into junior high school, middle school for some people. I'm telling my age, I guess. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so when I got in seventh grade in junior high school, that's when you sit in the classroom setting with that desk in front of a chalkboard or overhead, overhead projector. And I realized that I couldn't see what's on the board. I mean, wow. And I couldn't see what's an overhead projector. Now, I would see some things or some things I could recognize. 
and that was going on. Also, what's going on now in middle school? That's when everybody's trying to find themselves, puberty, things like that. So I'm starting to get bullied now, get picked mm. on, talked about, just like so other kids to fit in and things like that. I was a kid that tried to pick on things like that. So all this was going on. My grades just dropping. I always had good grades in school, and so my counselor. And I wish I could find her today. I'm gonna throw her name out there. Anybody out there listening? No, Carol Sharon. I heard she's in California, but I, if I could find this lady, I would, I would love to see her and thank her for the things she's done for me. That was my counselor in, in junior high school. Wow. And let me just go back. You're being bullied at this time. And is that based on your vision or based on the fact that you're not keeping up with was, the, your classmates? Or like, what was the premise of the bullying? It was basically my vision. Um, Cause I would be in class, have a book close to my eyes. Um, they would see that my eye would move left and right. Kids would come in to say things like, how many fingers I got up and move their hand in front of my face and stuff like that. Um, mm. I got up called all types of names, Mr. Magoo, things like this, you know, and it was, it was hurtful, but I, I, I endured it because one thing I didn't, you know, and some kids would try to, they think they, they would come like want to fight me because they think they can beat me, the blind kid. I can beat the blind kid to show myself. But my father would never let me and my brother just, just anybody just bully us and, and jump on us. We was always taught to fight back. And I will fight back, things like that. If it's any consolation, Welby, one of the guys I work with that is totally blind was a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu black belt. Uh -huh. So yeah, so yeah, that's maybe they I, should fight him. <laughs> yeah, that, and that's what I'm saying. So Because I'm blind, don't mean I, I can't defend myself. That's yeah. And I am going to defend myself. So, you know, so Good for was, you. It, it was basically because of my vision that, that happened. Mm -hmm. And so my counselor, she did basically her own observation of what was going on. She talked to some of my teachers and find out what was going on and talked to my parents. And my parents thought they would it just be going from, to, from transitioning from elementary to junior high school. But in reality, I wasn't able to see the board, the overhead, some of my textbooks. Right. So she had a set. So my counselor decided she set me up with the visual service for the vision impaired. Which is, which is BSBI now, it's a, through the state of Ohio with Vocational Rehabilitation Services. And so they met my parents, my counselor. And this, this is funny. So my mom tells me this one day, she said, hey, you ain't got to ride the bus home from school because me and your dad got to come up there to talk with your counselor and the guy from BSBI. Okay. Then I got nervous because what are they going to do for me? And all, and all I'm worried about is how it's going to make me look in front of my friends, the other kids in school. I'm already getting talked about now. I was so nervous this day. So they had called me down in the office. <laughs> and they was all happy, smiling. So they had some visual aids for me, which is fine. They gave me that magnifier and things like that. And then the guy said, well, also, they also got me talking books on cassettes and record, records. And a cassette player and record player I could take home listen to books. That was fine. Then he, he pulls out this bag, a replica of the books they got me. Now, it, it was large print, but at, back then it was like the books are now. This book was probably as big as a computer monitor. <laughs> and I wow. looked at the book. And the first thing I said, I said, you guys really expect me to walk in class with these big books? I said, they already talk about me now. They're really going to talk about me. And everybody in the room expression just dropped because nobody thought about that. But my counselor, Mr. Rohn, she says, well, I got an idea. Take these books home, do your homework and study with these books, and just use, bring your regular books to class, and you, you can just use those in the classroom. And that's what I did. So at that point, middle and junior high school, everything was fine. So when I got back to high school, it kind of got back to where it was in the beginning when I got to junior high school. My counselor never helped me. But what I learned to myself, I, I started to become more confident with myself being vision impaired. So what I would do on my own, I would approach my teacher and say, hey, can I, can I get your notes on the board or the overhead projector because I can't see it and things like that. And I would ask for extra time. I would just ask for the things myself that my counselor should have been done, did for me. So now let's fast forward to my senior year. I, uh, I'm, you couldn't tell me back then in 1980, it was 1984, my senior year, graduate 85. I wasn't going to Kent State University and I'm just going to major in computer science. That was my plan. So I go on with my counselor. Now, this lady never worked with me as a vision impaired student at all. So she says, well, What's your plans? And I, you know, just, and it just rolled off my tongue because it was so what I wanted to do. I said, I want to major in computer science and I plan to go to Kent State. And 
And they wrote right of her tongue right back. Well, you're not cause of material. You should just go find a job. Mm. So at that point, she said that in my mind, I said, she just said I was not cause of material. I just find a job. And so we and we we stayed, we were talking for a while, but I'm gonna tell you, I couldn't tell you what she said after that point. So when she was talking, it sounded like the peanuts parents talking, womp, 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 womp. That's all I heard the entire time. But I left out of that room and I said, I gotta go to college and I gotta graduate because this this day is not gonna be right. I know mm -hmm. what I'm doing, and that's what I'm gonna do. Now the only thing that she didn't is two things she didn't get right by the whole thing. I didn't go to Kent State and I didn't major in computer science. <laughs> but I did go to University of Akron and got two degrees. I got a Bachelor of Science in, uh, in Technical Education. I got Associate of Applied Business Management Technology. Good for you. Yeah. I so, love the I love the fact that your reaction to basically an adult, an authority figure saying you can't do something was like, oh, well, now I have to do it. <laughs> Right? Yeah, I, <laughs> there's no question in your mind like yeah, you said I can't do it that means I have to do it right that's I fantastic to. yeah I, I mean this to. makes total sense <laughs> <laughs> right? it does um come on my mom my mom and my grandmother my dad's mom they raised me not as a vision impaired kid they made it as a person who happened to be right. impaired so this is just a part of me but it, it doesn't define me and I, I want to be defined on what I'm doing in society, how I can make people better. That's always been my goal in life. Yeah. And 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 sometimes I don't even bring up that I'm visually impaired unless, unless somebody may ask if I'm in a certain circle, things like that. Mm -hmm. And so that 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 would I would never use that as an excuse for me. It's just a it's just a part of me, and there's barriers to me that I I, I let me go. There's things I know I can't do. I'm not going to sit there and tell you that, hey, I'm going to go buy me a car tomorrow. I'm going to drive to wherever. Right. So, and I think that most people who are blind and vision period, like I me, mean, we don't put ourselves in position to fail because people already expect us to fail and people don't want to give us a chance. So I definitely want to make them, make their job easy for them to tell me no. That That's always a factor with me. So as I got, I got, I got into college, I got my first job was working at the University of Akron and, uh, I end up working in this program called Advancing Health Program. And what the program is is a um, it's a wealth it was a welfare to work program that people who receive government assistance to come to come on campus and get get their basic skills up to either get enroll in the college or help them find employment. And I taught basic math to the, to the participants who came in. And also, we ran a program with the African Public Schools. It was a pilot program that ran with the, with the special ed kids. And it was a high school that was in the middle of campus. So those kids that went to what's called Central Howard, like, they would come up in the morning and I would teach them probability skills to them. And then in the afternoon, I, they would do different, different jobs on campus to get their work experience. And I would go by and make sure they're doing the jobs right, things like that. So I was I was the liaison for, for the University of Akron and we had a liaison for the Akron Public Schools. And one day, this, this is how God works, things happen. He says, I want you to come down and meet the teacher. I want you to meet the counselor to work with these kids. I said, okay. So I walk down, meet the teacher, and I go into the counselor's office. Guess who the counselor was? I've, I've got to guess. guess. We're, just, we're both smiling. <laughs> Maybe somebody who told you you shouldn't go to college. <laughs> yeah, the same, my same counselor that I told me I, I was a college material, material. Here I show up, helping her with a pilot program that started with two degrees, and I'm and I working with your kids. What, how fantastic was that? Yeah. And did I, she recognize you? Oh, she recognized me, but and people always ask me, "Well, did you tell her who you were?" I said, "No, she knows." Yeah. So you just, you know, you divide in the room. She knew who I was. Now she may not remember what she said to me, but who knows? But she knew who I was. Right, and then yeah. probably at that advancement and things, it's not necessarily even important at that point. Oh yeah, you know, no doubt. That, that I told you so is probably not what you were looking for. You had achieved what you had achieved, and. She and knew it. Everybody knew it. That's fine. Right, and I and I view it like this: she was a few the care that fueled me to keep on going to be the person that I am. Because there was some struggles along the way that when I was in college <laughs> that I thought that I wasn't gonna finish college, but that always came to my mind. So I got to finish. I just I just got to because I cannot yeah. let this thing know that I did not graduate from college. Especially you know, when I, when I, when I, well, I, just one of the things I want to say this that 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 I'm uh, sitting here thinking about hearing your story before you continue, right, mm -hmm. is that 
you know, that's a really neat moment that you're talking about there where, where somebody says, uh, Hey, you can't do this. And then you end up doing it, but going back even further when you were being, um, when you were being bullied and you essentially as a young boy needed accommodations to be successful in school, you know, like you said, like it's, you, you don't want to define yourself by your blindness. You're a person who happens to be blind, but obviously there's certain limitations, certain things that you can't do in certain ways that you're going to need accommodations to be successful. That's what our business is all about. Right. But the added element for me that's really interesting and that I hadn't stopped and thought about it is that a young that as a young boy, there's a whole social dynamic that you got to be careful of too. And just the fact that you yourself and the adults around you recognize that and were very careful. And, and I think a lot of people don't think about this. They were careful with your young, you know, that with a young person who was trying to navigate all that social all those social dynamics, they were very careful with how they provided those accommodations for you. So not only could you be successful in the academics that you needed to be successful in, but it also gave you the best chance of being successful socially. Right. And I think that's something I haven't heard in a lot of people's stories. And I think that's something that it's a new thing for me, Welby. I talk to a lot of people who are blind and have a variety of disabilities and that dynamic of that young, the picture you paint of that young boy who's trying, who's struggling in more ways than one. And, um, and just the dynamic of having to deal with that is really, really interesting. I appreciate you bringing that to us. I didn't yeah, mean to I, interrupt you, but I wanted to make sure. I would say, I'm, one thing I would, I would, my mom, my grandmother always told me is you can do anything you want if you put your mind to it and there's something you believe you can do and know that, and, but be honest with yourself, know what you're capable of doing. Mm -hmm. And my, my mom would never allow me. I would go and say, well, mom, I can't do it. You can do it. You need to do it. Well, can you do it for me? He said, what? You got to do this by yourself because I'm not going to be around you all your life. I'm not right. going to be around you all your life. You're going to have to be able to do things on your own no matter what you're dealing with. We all deal with something. But you need to work it out. And you get help if you can't do it. But you got to do things that you're capable of doing. And that's and that yeah, it sounds like you had an amazing mom, right? Yeah. And, and I'd like to dig into her a little bit more because – what I'm hearing, like your attitude of, of, I just, you know, I, I am a person and all the things that come with that, that happens to be blind. It sounds like your mom treated you as your child, her child who just happened to be blind and gave you the same advice as she would any other child. And, and I think that that's a huge credit to your mom. And it's somewhat, I don't know if unique is the right word, but I think that when a person who doesn't have a disability or something as profound as a as vision loss as a child that has something as profound as vision loss they kind of get stuck in that a little bit right they they all of a sudden that's the biggest deal in the world and 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 i i can see where they may start to define their child as being blind first in that case or whatever but but your mom didn't do that to her credit she really stepped up and and parented you in a beautiful way yeah right yeah, yeah I, I commend her for that i got sure I, I wasn't that kid who i didn't hang out at the blind centers too often because mm -hmm. i think there it felt like you i was being helped all that caught up kind of i guess helped out things like yeah. that Versus allow me to figure out on my own because my mom, she really, she said, you know, I may not be around. Your grandma may be around. Your dad may be around. It might be just you. And what you going to do? Yeah. I, it, it, so you're not over coddled, right? She's like, right. It, you got to make it in this world like anybody else. Yeah, I don't care I if you've got vision lost. You go do like, it. <laughs> right. I was sitting around a crisis of time like a little kid. Like, go on, mom, help me. Nope. And she just walk off. Wow. Dara, well, you had a question or a comment? Well, I was curious, what do you have an example in mind of something that your your mom basically got you to figure out on your own, like something something that really stands out to you in that way? I, I'm, I'm gonna tell you a story. So, and I, I I wanted to put this in a book, but my my editor it didn't relate to what we, what my book's about. Mm -hmm. So so this will go in the second book. Is that what you're saying? Well, <laughs> yeah. So I, I write a Kindle Villa right now about about <laughs> this story is in there. I was eight years old and 
and our and I, the street I grew up on is kids everywhere. Our block was full of kids on my age up and down the block. And we always hung at this one my one friend's house, his name is Butch. We hung out and we still in this stoop and we always be talking. And some of them had played baseball like the year before, and they talking, hey, you guys should play with us, come out and play. And I'm like, yeah, I'm playing baseball. My grandfather played baseball, my uncle played baseball. I said, oh yeah, I'm playing baseball. And like I said, I might even think about my vision is going to stop me from playing. I'm playing right. baseball. So I go down to, to my house. I get in. My dad's there. My mom's not there. I say, hey, dad, um, he team me up to the Y and sign up for baseball. Everybody going to play baseball. And he said, well, you know, and my father is more, I guess, worried about me failing about my business parent than that me try it, which I would, that would bother me, but I understand where he's coming from now. Right, right. But he said, well, I don't know about you playing baseball. You know, that might, you might be able to be good. That might be good for you. And I'm like, what? What? And so in my mind, like, you know, every every dad when his son playing sports, I'm saying to myself, so mom came home, I could reason with her. And I said, hey, I want to try it out. I don't know what I can do. She said, okay, you can go ahead and try it. For the first year of baseball, <laughs> it was great. You know, I might have one hit the whole season, but I had fun, I, you know. My other friend, they was hitting the ball, but I might have struck out. I have no idea. I might got one hit, and I knew it was luck because I knew I could see the ball coming up. Down the pipe. But that, so what I did, I, I I enjoyed. So the next year we moved up to the upper, like they call it the major league upper, upper age, and he had to try out. So I go to that, go to try out. I get, I get picked for a team, and so the first day of practice, this is when I. This is how things work. So our coaches hit the fly balls. They, they taught us how you know if you a ball coming, you, you caught out. Everybody move out the way you catch the ball. Okay, I got it. Ball hit a fly ball. And my at the time I had wire. It, there were no sports goggles back then, so I had wire frame glasses on. So here's a fly ball, and I couldn't I could never see the ball come off the bat, but I could the sound I, the sound would let me know where the ball would be in the air because I can listen. And then I would see it as it started to come down and gets close. So I saw it coming. So this ball, I misjudged it. So the ball hit off my glove, hit my glass, and cut the left side of my eye. And it cut the gas. That's it. it. Mm. So, and this is before cell phones. So uh, my coach ended up taking me to the ER. My bike was at the field, so my buddies had to get my bike take to his house. And they had to Call my house to find my parents. And they wasn't at home in time. They, they, so they came. That was in my baseball career. Because I now I'm now I'm scared of a baseball for that fact. But what I what happens in that scenario is that I I I didn't know if I could play or not, but I wanted to see. Mm. And I had to, and I had to see because if I didn't do that, I would have beat myself up because I didn't give it a try. So right. I, I I now I know that. That's not for me. You're so, basically so, saying it mattered more to try it out than it did to actually like be good at baseball or anything. It was more the idea of trying baseball. And, and, and the thing about it, when I got when that happened, I got picked on again. All, all my friends talked about me. I got to school. Oh, you couldn't see the ball. You couldn't see. It. And I, I go to school like the next day with about 15 stitches in my head. You know, they're talking about me. But I, I rather endure all that bullying and stuff like that. For me, I tried it. Mm. That's the goal. My goal was I tried it and I know it didn't work. Versus me to sit back and let, let somebody like my dad tell me, well, you shouldn't, you can't play that because you're not going to be good. I don't know that. Right. So I need to do, do those things. Listen, now, Welby, I got a story for you. Okay. Right? My vision is fine. <laughs> right. It's fine. Right. Right. I got about one hit <laughs> per season. My dad threw practices and said, dad, I'm terrible at baseball. We got to practice, right? So I go out on the street with my dad and we practice and he throws up that, uh, that, that's the, you know, that love you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, yeah. Guess what happened? Hit me right in the eye. I had to go to the ER. <laughs> my vision's <laughs> fine. I don't think, you, I don't think your experience was any different. I, <laughs> I don't think it had anything to, I think right, you're just I, like I, me. Yeah. You just weren't good at baseball. Yeah, <laughs> united I, I know, united then, in baseball accidents. And right. then my team, I was so bad. My team started picking on me. Right. Well, they bullied me. 
I'm not joking. That's not a joke. I'm telling right. you the truth. I finally halfway through the season, it was the same thing. I did better in the in the in the you know when I was younger, and then when I got into the the bigger leagues, right. and I quit halfway through the season because my team was so mean to me. Right, I get it. I, yeah, I, pain. I, I never went back, but I I had to do that for myself. I yeah. Yep. I, well, you know, and, and I think that, uh, that's not a story, you know, that's not a story that only somebody with something like vision loss can tell us. I mean, that's a life story, right. For all of us mm -hmm. where we've dug in and we've tried something and we just had to figure out right through, through effort and, and trial and error that maybe that wasn't the path for us. Right. Well, it's like, you know, sometimes enthusiasm is more than, you know, your actual skills in the area, but it's like enthusiasm is always a good thing. Well, I, if you're not willing to try, how are you ever going to know? You know what I mean? Like it's, it's sometimes it's, it's about learning that lesson and being willing to learn that lesson. Otherwise you'd be afraid to try that thing that maybe you try and find out you're good at, you mm -hmm. know? Mm -hmm. And, um, and I think that that's the, that's the real lesson is that you were willing to push the boundaries in order to understand what your boundaries were. Right. Well, that actually you know? goes right into something from when I listened to another podcast you had been on, you talked about your first experience with like getting praise for your writing, but you weren't super interested in writing at the time. So yeah. it didn't, it didn't go a lot of places. And I, I want to hear about your experience with learning that you were good at writing. Writing is a mysterious art. And yeah, I want to, I want to kind of hear about that experience of finding out that writing was something you had a skill in. Yeah. So, uh, that was freshman year in college. It's a uh, English 111. I've never get English comp. And I'm just taking English just to take that as a general studies course everybody had to take it. So our professor, he he had, I don't know, it was an entertainment paper. He, we could write about anything he wanted to entertain wise. And that's what he had to write about. So me and a couple of buddies, yeah, we had took this trip from Akron, Ohio to Virginia Beach. I think it was like Labor Day weekend. It was like Black Greek weekend there. And so we had to stop in D.C. because a couple of friends went to uh, Morgan State. We picked them up and went on to D.C., went on to Virginia Beach and had a great time. And so I wrote about that trip. And so I turned it in. And I'm not thinking, I'm not thinking nothing. Of, I'm thinking like, let me just get my B in this, this four credit class and move on. I'm not, I'm not going to do nothing with English. This is just a, something to get, I got to take. So about a, a week or so later, we had class and we, we had to leave. So the professor said, asked me to stay, stay, stay after. Now in my mind, I'm like, did I plagiarize something? I said, that paper was about me. I said, I, I said, what are you gonna talk to me about? So he first thing out of his mouth was said, Well, what, what's your major? I said, uh, and that was computer, and that that was freshman year. So Computer science. He's like, oh, you ever thought of being a writer? I said, no. I said, I said, right up here, I got to take English all my life. Nah, I'm not thinking about <laughs> being a writer. No. He said, oh my, you, you're you're good. I mean, you you're great. You're like you have the skills down already. You, you write very well. Just paper you wrote. I said, oh okay. I just wrote about what I saw, what I mean, what I experienced. And so I never took that nowhere after that. I said, yeah, this guy won't be a writer. I would tell people that story that like he won't be. I said, I ain't thinking of English class. I ain't taking that. You ought to do all that stuff. Nah, I'm good. So later on, yeah, I always want to write a story about me, my vision and parent. And so this is how I end up writing the book. So my girlfriend, she told me about this program at Georgetown University. And I was like, oh, okay. She said, you should apply for it. You, know, you, you always want to write your book. You should, you should, this is an opportunity. And so it, it's called the Creator Institute at Georgetown. And it's a free program. You just have to pay for your editors. So I applied. Now, and when I apply, it's like I'm pacifying her. And it kind of like pacifying me. At least I tried it because I'm not going to get accepted. So I filled it out. <laughs> I get a call, an email from Professor Coaster's assistant. Saying, hey, you want to set a meeting with me? I like set a meeting. Up. I like what? What did I do wrong? Yeah, yeah. and I, I, <laughs> yeah, no, I've had those meetings. Yeah. You're really happy when you didn't do anything wrong. Yeah. So <laughs> I'm not saying that now. You know what I said there? 
I said, I ain't trying to write no book. <laughs> I'm like, uh, okay. So I meet with him. I tell him what I'm writing about. He's all great. This, he gave me an assignment on the phone. I need you to go find about 25, 30 people, successful blind people that's on YouTube or online, and you're going to use those for your sub story. Like, so I said, what? Okay. So I did all that. So I go to class. So now, my, now I'm, I'm in the class. I'm I'm writing a, a memoir. That's what I'm, that was a, that's my original book I'm writing mm-hmm. about me. And so when you go through the program, you have you work with editors throughout the process. So your first editor is a, is a DE editor, which is distributing editor. And this editor's job is to make sure that you just write content, get stories, give them stories. You just keep writing stories. And so and you meet with this. I meet with her once a week. So about three weeks in. I done wrote a few things and so that's because she gave me writing how many words he, each week I gotta write. So finally we talking. She says, All right, well, I got a question for you. And my also she she has a disability too. So they pair me with somebody that has a disability, basically understand what I'm going through as a writer in my story. So she said, Yeah, you got some great stories here. So you write a memoir, huh? I said, Yeah, I'm writing a memoir. <laughs> so her name is Joanne. Her 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 question, well, I got a question for you. Who's going to read your memoir? I'm like, what? That's what you mean. She said, you know, people write memoirs and do like celebrities, athletes, past presidents, people like that. You will be brought from Akron, Ohio. I said, so who's going to read your story besides your family, your friends, maybe some people from Akron? I'm like, this is a great story. I said, said it's true, but who knows you? She said, hey, I don't read Well Be Brought Us' memoir. So she said, you should write a book about teaching people with disabilities how to get jobs. And I sat back and thought about that for a second. I said, no. I said, Joanne, because we already know how to, we already know how to skill. Pretty much everybody who has a disability has gone through some type of rehabilitation training. You either get employment, you get in school to show what, what jobs are best, best we can do for our disabilities. So we already know that. I said, I'm going to flip it. I'm going to write a book to educate business owners, executives, and HR, our, HR nice. professionals on the benefits of hiring us, the blind and vision fair. So she, she even tried, discouraged me, said, well, you know, that's going to be hard. I said, it has to be done. And I'm up for the task. You said, try playing baseball when you can't see. That was hard. This is going to be easy. Right, right, right. <laughs> and there was, nothing out there, there was nothing out there like that. Because I, I, I did research before I even did it. I said, and I told her, there's no books even talking about us. She said, well, that's you want to, I said, yeah, that's what I'm going to do. And that's, and that's what I did. And so, yeah. right. So you're kind of so, going toward this, like, they always say, you know, to write for a niche where there isn't anything already. That's kind of what you were planning to do, right? To do something that there wasn't one of already. Right. So I'm, I'm kind of like a rebel at some things. So I would go against the grain sometime. And I felt like I know where she was coming from. Like the easier way was to write a book on how to how to get a job at the blind right. person. I get it. Well, she's trying to sell a book, right? So she's yeah, she likes right. that easy path. Right. But the blind and visual pair people that, that want to work already know how to get go about getting jobs. Yeah. That don't that want to work. So mm-hmm. they can go get that training already from anywhere for free through any state in the country or US territory. Actually, that's a section of my book too. But <laughs> yeah. So I decided to write this book, educate them. And and even the people I interviewed for the book who like professionals in this in the diverse equity and inclusion field say, wow, nobody even there's no material out there even about this population like right. that. I said, yeah. So that's why I did it. Nice. So let me ask you this. You know, you're talking about how and I think this is the other other way we kind of find passions is that we don't we don't even realize our passions, but as somebody encourages us towards them they become that right so did you do you like once you kind of got over your initial lack of desire to write did you find the joy in it i mean when you sit down to write do you do you find that joy i love it yeah it's it's, it's the best thing i've ever done and i'll I'll probably continue writing is it really great i i love writing it's 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 probably this is the 
besides my having my son, the biggest accomplishment I think I've been in my life. Yeah. I, I really do. And and it's it's amazing because I have a <clears throat> I'm not gonna go into it deeply, but I kind of have a, a similar story in that I wasn't good at writing. Um and I was, you know, my teachers and professors told me that in no uncertain terms, but I eventually turned into a writer um, myself and man, did it feel good when I figured it out and started doing it. I had no idea because I, I struggled, you know, with those academics. I had no idea how good something like that could feel. So I can really appreciate where you um, discovered that you know and that's 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 it's discovering passions like that is also is is almost as uh interesting and important and all that as as pursuing a passion right and right. i think allowing yourself to be open to discover those things and listen to other people is is another kind of message i'm hearing from your story welby you know well i'm actually oh sorry mark did you have something else to say? no no i'm good i'm good i was curious what and in the end, started to draw you in about writing. Was it just the accomplishment of completing something each day? Was it literally working with sentences? Like, what what do you find excited about writing? I think the exciting part. So this program at Georgetown, their premise is you write in a community. So you you go in, everybody on the earth is this platform called Quip. I know you guys are familiar with Quip. With no, all, quip. all our all my material is in this in, in this quip and it's a community with, with everybody. So like let's say if us in there, all of us got our own folders. I can look at your folder, you look at mine. So okay. if you say, hey, okay. Mark, you say, well, but hey, I got this guy you might want to interview for your book, or Mark, I got somebody you might want to interview. This guy might put people book. So, so like truly collaborative. Yeah, because statistics show that if a person who's writing a book by themselves, especially self-publishing. Mm -hmm. that's, they teach, they teach how, that's what they teach us how to do. You, you never finish. But people who write together in a, in, as a group tend to finish more because you got the support system from one another. And, and so when I was doing this writing, you know, it was just like, it's something that I never thought I would ever accomplish, even though I knew I wanted to write a book. I thought I would never accomplish. And once I got started, it was like nonstop. Even the bad part, of it, like I got writer's block at one point. I got COVID, and this is before the vaccine. I was mm -hmm. I was out of work for a month at home. Mm. But one, one thing I did do, I got up every day with my robe, and pajamas on, and got in front of my laptop <laughs> and tried to meet my deadlines. Right. And, I, and, and, at, and at that time, it was when they was they they look at your manuscript and say, hey. Are we going to take your story and publish it? And I had a deadline to meet, or it was like done. And I got up and I had, and I had to meet the, meet the professor on Zoom. I went up on my road, and, it, and he says, what's going on? I said, I don't know. I'm sick. I got to go get a COVID test tomorrow. And he said, you like crap. You want to just cancel? I said, no, we can't cancel. We can't cancel. I got to go through this. So, And I did. And I love the good about it. I took you I love the good about it, the bad about it, everything, because I'm telling a story that that needs to be told, and I and I like writing nonfiction, so it's I got it. I, I like put put messages out there that that need to be told, and I realized when I was doing it, those are story type of books I like to read myself anyway about right. stories, help self help books, uh, books that tell you about things going on. I, I I that's that's my genre, so and that's what I write about. And I think that, like everybody has a story in them. I think everybody should at least write one book because everybody has a story to share that society may need. I do believe that. That's great. What a great message. Well, listen, we're we're kind of coming to the end of the podcast here, Welby. And I'll tell you what: when you came and spoke to us and my team, you really won me over, and you've won me over all over again. I absolutely love your stories, and I love the way that you've just conducted your life. And we all have unique situations that we're presented with in life. And you've really, you've really done the best I think that you could with yours. And it's just, it's, it's, it's so interesting to hear about. And it's so inspiring before we wrap up. Is there anything else that you want to, that you want to say or, or tell people or anything, any part of your story that you really want to get out there before we, uh, before we say goodbye. I just want, I want the, the business world, executives, HR professionals, business owners, 
you miss out an untapped market of the blind and vision impaired, vision impaired community who can pretty much do any job that requires you to use of technology and pretty much all your operation system, your computer has accessibility technology built in, you just don't access it. to get this population a chance. And if you don't have it, there's even places like state vocational rehabilitation services get you programs like JAWS, Zoom, Text, and things like that to help these, these individuals be productive employees in your company. And especially now, with all these help wanted signs all over the nation, is an untapped market that you can tap into that your competitor is not even thinking about. Trust me. So I just say, give them a chance. Give so basically, a basically, you're telling managers and stuff that a lot of the tools they need to help accommodate people are already there. Basically, it has to be by law. <laughs> Every any company that has any company software company that creates operation system has to have accessibility technology built in. It is a lot of times the employers don't even know that it exists. It's there. And, and if something needs something that's besides that, it's a minimum cost. And if you're a small company, based on ADA guidelines, you can get exempt on that type of stuff and maybe get some assistance to pay for it as well. So it's, it's, to me, there's no excuse. I think the, I think the problem is, 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 the, is the fear because of the fear unknown. I'm going to say this one part. The difference between individual with binary vision impaired versus somebody else with another disability is that all our our conditions are different within the vine of vision care community. What I may need is just enlarge my screen. Somebody else might need a braille reader or screen reader. Somebody else might need jaw. Somebody might need something else to, to be accountable. And that's the fear employers have because they, they fear the unknown. Mm -hmm. But it's still simple. You know what, Welby? Somebody should write a book so these executives know all this stuff, don't you think? <laughs> I got one. Leave oh, you got house. one. <laughs> well, since you got one, can you can you tell everybody what the name of that book is? And yes, how so we can all look it? it up. My book is titled "Leading Blind Without Vision: The Benefits of Hiring a Blind and Vision Impaired." You can find it on, on all online platforms that sells books, e audio books, and eBooks. Um, you go to my website, Broadest Vision Soul. So that's B R O A D D U S V I Z S O L dot com. And my book is that's on, on my website as well. And if you got you want to use some consulting service to onboard some some blind and vision impaired employees into your workforce, or do want me to come in and do a training, because you can actually get CERN credits now for my business. Wow. HR professionals, you can go to you email me as well at broadestbizso at gmail.com. And as, as always, we'll make sure all that stuff is in the show notes so you don't have to sit there and, and write this down, particularly if you're listening in your car or while you're working or something like that, we'll make sure all that's written down for you and you can just grab it in the show notes. Hey, Welby, really, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. I think you're doing great work out there. Um, we appreciate it um, because it's, uh, you know, in our, our business, um, we're trying to, we're trying to help um, every, everybody be able to uh, access information and uh, do the same jobs as, as everybody else. So you're doing that same good work and we really appreciate it. And we appreciate you being willing to share your story with us today. Yeah, was, I, appreciate uh, you guys. I appreciate you guys, what you guys do, because you help us buy and vision people be, be play on the equal playing field like everybody else. That's great. Well, you know, takes a village, right? It sure does. All right. Well, thank you so much. This thank is you. Mark Miller thinking well be and Dara and reminding you to keep it accessible. This podcast has been brought to you by TPGI, the experts in digital accessibility. Stay tuned for more Real People, Real Stories podcasts coming soon.